one. Okay. Right. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. Today we continue our lecture series on COVID-19, with a discussion on its effects on the mental health of our frontline providers. We are joined by one of our experts who will guide us through this topic, Dr. Jessica Gold. And then as a reminder, uh, please use the chat function to ask questions. I'll coordinate a Q&A session after the talk. And for everyone that wants to sign in, all QR codes will be available during the question and answer session as well at the end of this PowerPoint. I did have a, a brief blur prepared, but uh, Dr. Gold was kind enough to provide one as well. And seeing that uh, she's much more accomplished in both public speaking and writing, I think I'll defer to her. So uh, Jessica Gold is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. She's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania uh, with a BA and MS in Anthropology and the Yale School of Medicine. She completed her residency training in adult psychiatry at Stanford University, where she served as chief resident from 2017 to 2018. Dr. Gold is particularly interested in physician mental health and wellness, college mental health, women's mental health, and gender equity, and the overlap between popular media's stigma and psychiatry. More recently, she has been working on the hospital's mental health response to COVID-19 through the employee support team, has had the privilege to see healthcare workers and other employees through her clinic in the Center for Outpatient Health. In addition to research and publications in major academic journals, Dr. Gold writes for the popular press and has been featured in, among others, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time, Vox, Newsweek, Self, In Style, Glamour, and the Huff Post. She is also very active on social media, particularly Twitter, and was named one of Medscape's top 20 physician influencers on social media in 2019. And I can actually confirm this, I was hunting on Twitter yesterday. So I did, I did see your Twitter presence as well as the, your enthusiasm for multiple gifts uh, on Twitter. So um, it's my great pleasure to walk, welcome Dr. Gold as she presents mental health on the front lines before, during, and after COVID-19. Hi everyone. It's very interesting to be in this auditorium and present when there's just one person, um, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, I very much appreciate you having me to discuss this topic. Even just having me to discuss this topic is, shows that you guys are open to it, which is really important. So I'm going to be talking about mental health on the front lines. Let's see, click maybe. Okay. Um, so the objectives of this talk are to describe what we know about mental health of frontline workers prior to and during COVID-19 with some data from WashU, some about the U.S. and abroad, and then summarize what we know from the literature from past pandemics um, regarding the possible mental health aftermath and risk factors for worsening outcomes, and then talk a bit about the resources we have at WashU for coping with COVID-19 and some thoughts about what we should be doing in the long term for mental health of frontline workers. I have absolutely no relevant disclosures to this conversation. However, I do have to disclose that sometimes people pay me a paltry sum of money to write for freelance. And so that is what is, I'm disclosing. And sometimes people pay me another paltry sum of money to write, uh, uh, to read some books as a sensitivity reader for HarperCollins. Um, I very much believe that um, public health and the way that we communicate as health communicators is a best done when we marry data with narrative. Um, maybe that's a psychiatry bias, but I think that narrative is very powerful and data backs it up. So you'll notice that throughout the talk, I do both. Um, I'm going to start with what I consider to be a really powerful video that explains what life is like as an ER physician working on the front lines of COVID-19, um, done very well and narrated by a friend of mine. Um, and hopefully you can hear it all play and let me know for some reason if you can't and we'll look at the chat. They aren't here to say goodbye when they ask to withdraw treatment. 
FaceTime so they can say goodbye. We stop the drips, we turn off the ventilator, and wait. Your hands upon theirs. You think of their family at home sobbing. Someone starts saying a prayer. You can't help but cry. This isn't what we do. Wake up at 6.30 a.m. Priority is making a big pot of coffee for the whole day. Because the place by the hospital is closed. The Starbucks too. It's all closed. On the walk, it feels like Sunday. No one is out. Might be the freezing rain or it's early. Regardless, that's good. Walk in for your 8 a.m. shift. Immediately struck by how the calm of the early morning city is transformed. The bright fluorescent lights of the ER reflect off everyone's protective goggles. There is a cacophony of coughing. You stop, mask up, walk in. You take sign up from the previous team, but nearly every patient is the same, young and old. Cough, shortness of breath, fever. They are really worried about one patient, very short of breath, on the maximum amount of oxygen we can give, but still breathing fast. You immediately assess this patient. It's clear what this is and what needs to happen. We have a long and honest discussion with the patient and family over the phone. It's best to put her on life support now before things get much worse. You're getting set up for that, but you're notified of another patient coming in. You rush over. You're also extremely sick, vomiting. They need to be put on life support as well. Two patients in rooms right next to each other, both getting a breathing tube. It's not even 10 a.m. yet. For the rest of your shift, nearly every hour you get page. Stat notification, very sick patient, short of breath, fever, oxygen 88%. Stat notification, low blood pressure, short of breath, low oxygen. Stat notification, low oxygen, can't breathe, fever. All day. Sometime in the afternoon, you recognize that you haven't had any water. You're afraid to take off the mask. It's the only thing that protects you. Surely you can last a little longer. In West Africa during Ebola, you spend hours in a hot suit without water. One more patient. By late afternoon, you need to eat. Restaurant across the street is closed. Right, everything is closed. But thankfully, the hospital cafeteria is open. You grab something, wash your hands twice, cautiously take off your mask, and eat as fast as you can. Go back, mask up, walk in. Nearly everyone you see today is the same. We assume everyone is COVID-19. Where did all the heart attacks and appendicitis patients go? It's all COVID. We're all being asked to do things we've never done before. Try to predict which COVID patient will crash if you send them home and which won't. Talk to palliative care, talk to family members. Long discussions about likely outcomes. Listen as family members sound. They aren't here to say goodbye when they ask to withdraw treatment. We FaceTime so they can say goodbye. We stop the drips, turn off the ventilator, and wait. Your hands upon theirs. You think of their family at home sobbing. Someone starts saying a prayer. You can't help but cry. This isn't what we do. You stand by, you wait. This isn't what we do. You stand by, you wait. Time of death, 7.19 p.m. When your shift ends, you sign out to the oncoming team. You share concerns of friends throughout the city without personal protective equipment. Hospitals running out of ventilators. Colleagues have already gotten ill. Some have survived the disease. Unfortunately, other colleagues in the city have not. Before you leave, you wipe everything down. Your phone, your badge, your wallet, your coffee mug. All of it. Drowned it in bleach. Everything in a bag. Take no chances. You walk out and take off your mask. You feel naked and exposed. The streets are empty. You get home, you strip in the hallway. It's okay, your neighbors know what you do. Your wife tries to keep your toddler away, but she hasn't seen you in days, so it's really, really hard. Run to the shower. You look in the mirror. Indentations of the goggles are still deep on your face. Blisters on the bridge of your nose. Hot shower, rinse it all away. Never happier, time for family. We were too late to stop this virus, full stop. But we can slow its spread. Stay inside. Social distancing is the only thing that will save us now. I survived Ebola. I fear COVID-19. 
This virus has not only infected people all over the world, but it's highlighted. It's amplified the inequalities that have existed for way too long. At this moment of global crisis, we need global solidarity. And never, ever have scientists, frontline providers, grocery workers, and people doing everything that they can every day to keep our society functioning throughout this. Never have they been seen as the heroes that they really are. video and I apologize but I also think it's really important. So if you think about that being the day-to-day -day experience of somebody on the ground and you can think of all of the new things that somebody's experiencing as a frontline provider and then you combine that with the fact that not we're not starting with a blank slate. We know that physicians and I'm going to primarily talk about physicians but this does often include all healthcare workers. We know physicians aren't starting with a blank slate mental health concerns are not new. We talked about burnout and suicide long before this in physicians, and it's really well researched and well acknowledged. So before COVID-19, what did we know? So we knew we had high rates of depression. So um, systematic reviews, when you look at medical students, the rates of depression are about 27%. The rates in residents are about almost 29%. Um, and the rates in licensed physicians are 13% in men, 20% in women. That's not as good of a study, and it's from 1999. Turns out that's something that needs to be re-researched. Um, but what we do know is, um, in, at least in medical students and residents and fellows, it's definitely more common than age match peers. And then once you sort of get a little bit older, it evens out a bit, but um, it's definitely still high. Before COVID-19, we also had substance use. So we have equivalent rates of substance use disorders to the general population. About 10 to 15% of physicians will misuse substance uses, substances at one point in their career. Um, alcohol is the most common, but we definitely use prescription drugs at higher rates than um, other groups. So if you look at just opioids, 13 to 23% of female physicians use prescription opioids versus one to 3% of other groups and 14 to 23% of male physicians versus one to 4%. Then if you look at what groups of this in particular, it's ER medicine, psychiatry, anesthesiology, and people who work in solo practice are three times more likely. The good news for substance use is that programs do work. So physician health programs have actually successfully managed with five-year follow-up up to 80% recovery and return to work, which is much higher than in other groups. We also know we had high rates of suicide. So physicians are up there in groups with the highest rates of suicide of any profession. So we, the rates are approximated to be about 300 to 400 US physicians die a year of suicide, totally approximated. They're kind of going off of who identifies of having died by suicide, they don't know. Um, in general, we do know that male physicians tend to live longer and die less of other medical causes than other male professionals, but not of suicide. We also know that the suicide risk is elevated in men versus the general population and is even higher of an elevated risk in females versus the general population. So two to four times. That's different. I don't know how much you guys talk about suicide in your profession, but we definitely talk about it a lot in psychiatry. And we talk a lot about how suicide attempts are higher in females and suicide rates are higher in men. Um, this is a bit different in that we see females have a lot higher rates in doctors. We also know we had burnout. So what is burnout? So it's kind of this mix of things. So it's usually defined as a mix of emotional exhaustion, which is feeling used up at the end of the workday, plus depersonalization, which is like you're feeling like you're treating patients as objects or becoming more callous. So not caring as much about your work, not caring as much about patients, and then a sense of reduced personal accomplishment. So feeling ineffective or feeling a lack of value in your work. And if that all combined is what people are talking about when they talk about burnout. Um, the rates are very variable, um, but most papers, it's about 50% in trainees and physician groups. 
We also know burnout leads to a lot of consequences. So there's a bunch of papers that say burnout does all sorts of things. So it affects patient care. So there's papers that say there's lower quality care as a result. There's medical errors as a result. There's lower patient satisfaction as a result. There are papers that say the healthcare system is affected and there's reduced productivity, increased physician turnover, increased costs. The most interesting number I saw for that one was the lost productivity annually is equal to the loss of a graduating class of seven medical schools. That's a very big number. Um, I thought that was the most interesting number for that particular area. Um, and then obviously burnout is also directly related to physician health. So it affects substance use, it affects self-care, it affects motor vehicle crashes, it affects depression and suicidal ideation. So you're, it doubles the risk of having suicidal thoughts. We also did not have good care seeking before COVID-19. Um, if you look at the, what we know about the physicians who died by suicide, there were equal numbers of mental health problems in physicians and other people who died by suicide, but physicians were actually, the people who had mental health problems and died by suicide who were physicians were way less likely to be in treatment for those problems. That same doctor updated her study most recently and also found that in her new study, not a single female physician who died by suicide disclosed that she had suicidal intent to a healthcare worker at all before dying by suicide. So something is going on there where we're not getting care and we're not talking about it. Um, in med students, only 22% of med students with depression in one study use mental health services. In another study of surgeons, they were getting psychiatric medication by self-prescribing or by friends who weren't their treatment providers. Um, mostly were saying they were doing that because of concerns for their medical licenses. So, um, you know, a couple of states, a good amount of states actually, still ask whether you have any history of mental health treatment in licensing questions. And that's really scary for people because no one 100% knows what that means and whether your license is gonna have limitations or whether that's gonna mean that you're gonna not be able to operate as much. And so it definitely affects people um, it's against the Americans with Disabilities Act to ask those questions doesn't mean that they're changed. Um, people are definitely trying to work on that and have been actively trying to change that, but it is definitely something that is talked about and has prevented people from seeking care. And then, right, so then you have all of that, right? That is not a very pretty picture to start with. Um, burnout, suicide, depression, substance use, not going to care. And then you add COVID-19. What do we know about COVID-19? So people gave me some awesome data from what we know about WashU. This is not my data, but I'm very grateful that they let me explain it to you. So what we know from the preliminary data from the trainees, so 393 trainees were completed the survey, so that's residents and fellows. Um, anxiety rates are 18%, depression rates are 27%. If you remember, uh, what the rates of depression were for trainees, that's about equivalent. Um, there's actually not a lot of anxiety data, so we don't can't compare, but it seems about within the margin of error of what anxiety is in the general population. But again, if you're exposed to COVID-19, this is where the problem lies. So exposed to COVID-19, higher stress, more likely to be burned out, they were more likely to experience moderate to extremely high perceived stress regarding childcare and had a lower work family balance. And then in this same study, female trainees were more likely to be stressed and unmarried trainees were more, more likely to be depressed and more likely to have anxiety. Kind of pulling back and looking at the survey of faculty and staff and postdocs, that Dr. Avanoff has been sending around. Um, this is his uh, kind of first round of data as well. Huge amount of people filled this out. Um, only 915 of them, just so you know, are also clinical people, which means a lot of the people are just staff, which is also very interesting. A lot about the staff population in general. Um, what we do know from this is people are stressed, people are anxious, and people are sad, but 
What maybe is more novel or interesting is there's high rates of work exhaustion and really high rates of worsened overall well-being. 61% um, is a lot. Um, again, the people who work in the clinical work in high-risk settings and people who are caring for patients with COVID have the higher risk of and higher rates of stress, anxiety, burnout, and exhaustion. And then people who had a reported exposure to COVID-19, so either they were themselves diagnosed or someone in their family was, um, again, associated with higher stress, anxiety, depression, and work exhaustion. And then people who had more family and home stressors or had lower supervisor support, so they did this whole part of the study is looking at su supportive supervisors and the role of supervisors in, um, that was all independently associated with these outcomes as well, every single outcome. We don't have a lot of data, actually there is no data, but I'm sure a million people are working on this in the actual entire US about what is going on in mental health of healthcare workers. But what we do know from China um, in the preliminary data there, in the healthcare workers in uh, 34 hospitals there, high rates of depression again, high rates of anxiety, high rates of insomnia, high rates of distress. The people who are experiencing more severe degrees of this, nurses, women, frontline workers, and the people who are in Wuhan, which is the province that had the most, the highest re rates of um, COVID-19. And then again, the people who are the frontline workers who are actively engaged in the COVID-19 work had higher rates of all of it. When they looked at trainees, um, they looked prospectively at trainees. The people who, 26% had psychological distress and 11% met this criterion for probable acute stress reaction, which I think is their attempt to sort of measure PTSD because of timing, they can't call it PTSD. Um, they did a childhood adversity and stressful life events scale and said that anybody who had high rates of childhood adversity on the scale and also had high rates of stressful life experiences within the past year were also at increased risks of having more distress and an increased risk of having an acute stress reaction. But then people who did this scale and had higher rates of good family functioning had decreased risks, so that seemed to be protected. In Italy, take for what this worth, this is a preprint because everything seems to be preprint these days. Um, the PTSD symptoms also super high, really high rates of what they were calling severe depression. Um, and then again, same really like you can see the pattern to this, female gender, frontline worker, and then they added in having a colleague who was deceased. And then if they were hospitalized or quarantined, um, for having COVID, um, poor hospital, poor mental health outcomes. Um, I'm also put this picture on the slide, which I'm sure you guys have maybe seen going around the internet. And on my slides, you will see that the person who's the artist is at the top. You can buy this in shirts and all sorts of things. And it goes to helping frontline workers in Italy. I put it in here in case you're interested because the artist is Italian and it all goes to their, them. So if you want to help, that's one way to do it. But to me, again, it's so much more than the numbers. Um, as was mentioned in my introduction, I do like Twitter, but I do think that people on Twitter have, especially physicians, really taken it on themselves to kind of, you know, go beyond the numbers and explain what they've been seeing because there's really no way to do that otherwise. It's hard to embed journalists in hospitals. There's a lot of HIPAA rules to that. Some hospitals have allowed that, but it's been really hard to say, look, this is what we're really seeing. Look, this is what it's really been like, and look, I'm really struggling. So people on Twitter have done this, and I picked two tweets of people I think have done it well. Um, UJ Blackstock is in New York, she's an ER doctor. So um, she says, today several of my patients asked me how I was doing. I felt seen, especially behind layers of PPE. I thanked them, I was honest. I told them it's been a tough past few months, but I'm hanging in there. Ask your healthcare workers how they're doing. Um, and then Rana Adesh, who is a critical care physician in Michigan, 
and wrote In Chalk, which is a popular book, which maybe some of you have read. And I had her own like near death experience. Um, wrote, lately at the hospital, I narrate small shared moments out loud to stay aware of the absurdity of what we have begun to accept as our normal. Yesterday, walking in the basement tunnels, we were behind a man and a woman, all in black and a stretcher. So I found myself saying, I acknowledge that we are walking behind a body on a stretcher headed to the morgue during a global pandemic and the body is double bagged for contagion and we are on our way to be tested because our friends have all been diagnosed with the disease that killed that person. When I say the words, I see why answering how was your day has become increasingly difficult. It's all very surreal. I am aware of the need to process these moments and yet they just keep coming. So for now, I just name the moment out loud. For now, I am the narrator. So again, um, I really think that when we think about the way that narrated, like stories and narrative pair with these numbers, it really tells a better picture of what's going on. For me, I added for you, this is my nephew, he is eight. Um, my sister and brother-in-law are both physicians in Massachusetts. Um, I think that one of the reasons that I, this is really striking close to home for a lot of people is how it's affecting our kids. And people have kids at home and people are healthcare workers and then they're coming home and like Craig said, like having to not touch your kids or having to come home and um, try to explain things to their children. And this is my nephew trying to talk about what coronavirus is. You can tell he can't spell all of the words, but he also knows that it's a disease and he also is talking about the role of physicians. And I think that um, I put it in there because I think that's part of the full picture, which is that um, you can't tell a story without telling about how it is affecting families and how it's affecting kids because it's part of it. And then I threw in some more videos because I think they also tell more of it. This is Dara Cass. She's an ER doctor um, in New York. There was a week, like a week and a half, two weeks ago, it was bad. You know, it had been the end of really the onslaught of patients, but for some reason, everyone I knew was dying. Somebody in my department died. The best nurse I ever trained under died. A chief of ICU where I did my residency died. My friend's grandma died. My friend's mom died. It was like every day there was somebody. And I cried a lot because it's what you're supposed to do when people die. And then I got up and I did what I could do for the next patient. And if I think about it, I cry. But that's the natural grieving process, the moment that we're in, right? Is don't bottle up these feelings. Like lean into them if you're scared. But don't let them consume you. I mean, part of what I think that we need to learn about in this moment is how to deal with uncertainty. Because we are going to be in a really uncertain time for a really long time. There was a week. So part of what I really like about that is she's vulnerable. And I think that we don't talk about that a lot in medicine. Um, that's part of what I like about this next thing too, is they're talking about their stories and they're talking about emotions and they're talking about it in a very real way. Um, I cut this video, it's a lot, much longer video, um, but I think they also do a very good job explaining what they're seeing and how it's affecting them emotionally. Um, you'll see that I'm in this video. I tried to cut myself out because I really hate watching myself. Um, but it was really weird to cut halfway through. So there's a little bit of me. So sorry about that. Talking to someone in the minutes before the breathing tube is going in and they're getting put on the ventilator and telling them, I don't know if or when, how like we'll be able to get you off. The amount of emotional and physical stress is something I've never experienced in my life, even compared to a war zone. This is obviously the worst thing that any of us have ever seen. Physicians and patients alike are going to be reliving this trauma for years to come. if we have coronavirus ourselves, but we will not go get care if we're depressed. We will get 
get over coronavirus in weeks or days, like physically. We will not get over the symptoms of like the depression or the anxiety or the PTSD in days or weeks. At home, I am not myself. And uh, my wife is like certainly trying to help me with that and like be supportive while taking care of like the three young kids. I have a much shorter temper than usual sometimes, especially with myself. It doesn't go away when you go home. I have cried more than I have before while working in the hospital, uh, whether it's a part of patients or uh, while walking home. I ran for like 13 miles and I was, I've never been like that emotional, especially not like when I'm running. And for two points during that, like what, two hours of running, when I was just like bawling while I was running. And I didn't even like know what it was about. There was just so much like tension and and, um, and like that's just how it was coming out. We're asking them to give up their time. We're asking them to put themselves at risk. So that is also like physical risk. They don't have the proper equipment. I've seen people talk about having to intubate their friends. It's so overwhelming. There is no like break from COVID for us. I literally go to sleep and have all of my dreams are about COVID. You just walk into a place, everybody looks like an alien in a space suit. You don't know who is who. And then when you interact with the patients, you know, through gloves and um, you can touch them, but it's like when you're smiling and all the facial expressions, whether it's sad or trying to empathize with their, with their feeling, even trying to give words of comfort just seems very fake and it's wasted because that interaction is just completely gone. We see life and death all the time, but I think what's different now is the overwhelming number of people and how they get sick so fast. It really is unique, it really is different, and it really we feel powerless to in a, in a way. So basically in showing you all that, I'm just trying to make you guys comfortable with having to listen to doctors talk about emotions. So that's my secret plan. Um, but having said all of that, after COVID-19, what can we expect? So we have what we know we had before. We have all of these stressors that we're experiencing with COVID-19. And I think one of the things that isn't talked about a lot is, so what if you're not in New York? There are definitely extra additional things that we're experiencing that are not talked about. I think there's anticipatory stress. I think there's stress of when will it come? Is it coming? Is there a surge? Who knows? When is it coming? Are we going to look like New York? What does that look like? I think there's stress from things like pay cuts and furloughs. I think there's you know a lot of things that are going to affect medicine that um, might not always be this day-to-day -day thing that we're talking about. Um, I think, you know, our job looks very different. So when we talk about what COVID has created in medicine or done to medicine, it's not necessarily always just as a disease, though that's part of it. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, just because someone carries it well doesn't mean it isn't heavy. Um, I think that says a lot about physicians, honestly. Um, we do a lot to keep doing our jobs and keep doing our jobs well, it doesn't mean that it isn't hard. Maybe we don't talk about it. What do we know? I mean, not a lot, to be completely honest. Um, there's some data from past pandemics, but past pandemics don't look like this. <laughs> I mean, they just don't. Like, it didn't universally affect healthcare in the way that it is right now, um, but we can try our best to extrapolate. So what we know from SARS People had psychological effects. People were exhausted and scared. Um, lasted for up to two years in a study of healthcare workers in Toronto. They had burnout, they had distress, they had PTSD. Um, people also had um, reduced patient contact and work hours and had some behavioral consequences of stress. So I think that's just like you were angry and things unexpectedly like that. Um, the emotional distress they attribu attributed to social isolation, um, pain of losing colleagues to disease, and social stigma. So there's a lot of talk for um, past pandemics, um, uh, specifically SARS and Ebola, about what it was like to be a healthcare worker and get the disease, be quarantined, go back to the workforce, um, 
what is it like to feel like you could infect other people? Um, what is it like in your families? Is it stigmatizing that way? What's the role of the healthcare worker if the healthcare worker is the person who's infectious? That sort of thing. Um, there's a really good Lancet review, which is this Brooks paper that talks about kind of all of the data of quarantine and past pandemics, if you're interested. Um, that's where all of this comes from. So what is the quarantine data? Again, who knows, because we're all in self-isolation, which is different than quarantine, right? Um, but there are people that are quarantined, right? You get infected and then you get quarantined. So um, we can say that maybe this stuff is applicable to those people. And compared to the quarantine general public, healthcare providers who got quarantined had more severe post-traumatic stress, more stigmatization, were more avoidant of going back to work and not wanting to touch patients, um, were much more affected psychologically, um, and also were more likely to think that they had SARS or were gonna infect other people. Right after quarantine, which was nine days for SARS, um, was the most um, predictive of having symptoms of acute stress, which again is just very much just symptoms of post-traumatic post stress just right in that quick period. Um, and then predictors of post-traumatic stress of hospital employees, quarantine was a predictor of that up to three years later. So I think that just very much says like trauma doesn't have a timeline. Quarantine and the effects of something like COVID could go on for much longer. We shouldn't expect that just because it's over, it's over. Um, that this data I think also says that. So three years after quarantine, only 9% of a whole sample had high depressive symptoms, but of that group, 60% of them were people who had been quarantined. Um, that's a lot. Um, alcohol use and dependency had also in healthcare workers was associated with being quarantined. So um, higher substance use in that group as well. This is a really good review that just came out in the British Medical Journal that looks at basically every study that looked at the psychological effects of all of pandemics <laughs> and tried to look at what are the risk factors and what are the protective factors um, and how can we use that to figure out how to help. Um, there are 59 papers that met the criteria for what they used and most of them were about SARS, but they had some COVID-19 papers in there because they did include preprints too. Um, this uh, box that you see is the factors that increase risk. So the ones like we said a bunch of times, so increased contact with affected patients, um, not having uh, good PPE is something, um, increased time in quarantine, children at home, right? An infected family member, being female, we talked about, uh, lower household income, um, lower perceived personal self-efficacy, so like less ability to feel like you can do what you wanna do. Um, perceived lack of organizational support, um, lack of adequacy of training or confidence in infection control, uh, no compensation for staff. Um, so that I think all probably rings true for some of you, but also rings true with the data that we're seeing already. And this is the stuff that maybe decreased risks and what looks like decreased risks, right? So a lot of this I think is really important for like organizations when we think about this. So frequent short breaks from clinical duties adequate time off work, um, self-perception of being adequately trained. So that just means, are you, do you feel like you were trained well or supported? You know, I think if you feel like your team is supporting you and that they're doing the best they can and that they gave you the proper preparation to go in and fight a pandemic, you're going to come out a lot better. Um, do you have faith in the precautionary measures, like the ways in which you're being protected? to not get infected? Um, do you feel like your peers are supportive? Um, is your, do you have family support? So that's a big thing. Um, again, look at how many, like uh, the provision of protective gear is a big thing. So I, just simply providing PPE can really help people with psychological outcomes. Um, clear protocols and communication is another thing. Um, and then access to tailored psychological interventions based on needs. So again, like what, how do we make that something that we're doing? And so that's kind of where we come in. So what are we doing about it? Again, I just really like this quote. Um, so often we try to make other people feel better by minimizing their pain, by telling them 
that it will get better, which it will, or that there are worse things in the world, which there are, but that's not what I actually needed. What I actually needed was for someone to tell me that it hurt because it mattered. So again, sitting with feelings, something we're not good as doctors at doing, but we really need to get a little bit better. Um, here's the employee support team. So these are people that have been working on this from, you know, the second that this was a thing. So um, all different groups of people came together really quickly, said, all right, we need to think about the mental health of our own and we need to think about it quickly. Um, talk to people at other universities, talk to people um, and try to really quickly think of a plan of action. Um, these are the people that are involved. These are some other people that are involved. Very thankful for all of these people we meet multiple times a week. These are the elements like of kind of quick first aid, they call it psychological first aid, um, that when you're kind of grounding things in crisis that you think of with mental health. So like these, I think this slide's really helpful because I think even as a leader or a peer or a friend or a family member, these are things you can think about how to help. So in a crisis, what do you do? These are things you can think about. You can help with safety. You can help with connectedness. You can help with hope. So these are just like elements to think about that ground you in what you're working on. So when you're doing crisis interventions, these are the things that you kind of want to prioritize and not necessarily go much beyond that, but that's kind of how you help people in a crisis. This is an overview of what we've been working on. Um, so we called it coping with COVID. Um, you know, has a nice ring to it. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a central web se website, so you don't have to remember a lot of things. Um, just copingwithcovid.wustel.edu has everything on there. Um, it has all the resources. There's all of these resources, um, lot, which is a lot of them. But, you know, this kind of breaks down a little bit more because this is a nice flyer. Um, so there's a hotline. There's some Zoom groups. Um, some, I'll go into a little bit more of this. What do we have from the Department of Psychiatry? I'm biased, so I'll start with that. <laughs> um, so we started a hotline. So a lot of other universities were doing this, and we thought that this would be a good way to give back. Um, it's an all-volunteer hotline of people in our department. If you call that number, um, which is the main Department of Psychiatry number, if for some reason you forget it, um, it, there'll be people staffing it from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. and can help you with in the moment emotional support. You know, it doesn't have to be a crisis. It can be something you feel like you need to talk out. We're there to help. Um, and then we started a bunch of Zoom group sessions, which I'll go into a little bit more detail on the next slide. And then, you know, <laughs> we expanded our one-to-one -one appointments via telehealth. So I know that Psychiatry especially was kind of hard to get into for um, staff. And so we've been really prioritizing this. And so we have more availability and um, have made a couple extra counseling appointments as well for, in particular for COVID. Um, people have been giving their time for that. So if you call, we're here and that's what we're trying to do. So call if you need help, that's why we're here. Zoom groups. So if you go on that website, I actually put there's like a list and times and Zoom links and all of that. Um, I like to think of them, you know, like as classes in that you don't necessarily have to be like, hi, I'm Jesse and I have whatever, because that's stressful for people. I, I see college kids as patients too. And whenever we're trying to sell groups, the idea of having to introduce yourself is like the worst possible thing. Um, so if you think of it more as classes, I think it's helpful. So there's a lot of mindfulness classes. Um, I think that that can be very helpful, especially when you're feeling very anxious or stressed out. Um, there's a couple of skills-based classes. So like, if you're really anxious, you're feeling worried, how do you calm down? Um, there's even like mindfulness with your kids. So they offer it for different levels. How do you teach mindfulness with your kids of like toddler age and older ages and things like that? Um, there's a thing called navigating close relationships through tough times. So how do you navigate your relationships? I think that's one of the things that people have felt that they were struggling with. So a lot of these um, Zoom groups are born of things that people were talking to us about needing. So hopefully that's something that people will find helpful. Um, 
there's a creative expression class, um, which is, you know, through art and things like that. Um, and then there's a support group as well. And again, if there's like something that as a department you're interested in or want, you can talk to us and we can try to come up with something and direct something specifically for you. Additional resources, so the social work students are doing wellness checks. So if you called the hotline and you wanted a follow-up call, the social work students are doing that. The EAP still exists and they have a lot of resources and they have confidential counseling sessions. They have stress management. They sent out um, a COVID-19 toolkit and they have skills-based training. And then the applied leadership folks through HR who are awesome um, have these, have a bunch of, they basically help managers and groups like learn how to help their teams and make their teams feel more connected and engaged. So if you feel like that's something you're struggling with as a leader, um, there's the email for Karen on there and they can help there. I put a couple other things in here that I find are helpful and that I've been recommending to other people. So this is the COVID Coach. It's an app through the VA. Um, the VA actually makes really good apps. Um, it's basically based on their CBT um, for insomnia app, but it's kind of bigger than that. But it like lets you, it has some things for mindfulness. It has some things for just kind of like tracking your sleep. It has some things for like, uh, you know, ways to connect and ways to do grounding and ways to do deep breathing. So it's a pretty good app if that's something you're into. I know apps can sometimes be easier for people. These are other quick apps that I've had patients like. It's like a quick journal, a quick like daily prompt thing. These are also national resources that I've vetted as in talk to the people who founded them and vetted. So I promise you they're good resources. Um, so I know sometimes it's hard for all the reasons we talked about to go to WashU for resources is even though, you know, I'm one of the providers and I promise we're not that, that scary. Um, I think that I get why there's reasons why people might feel like less comfortable doing that. These are all things that were born from COVID nationally. So the physician's support line is staffed by volunteer psychiatrists all over the country seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 12 a.m. You can call that whenever you want. That's basically like our coping with COVID hotline, but nationally. Um, and Project Parachute and Emotional PPE are both pro bono teletherapy companies that you just like go on there, say like, hi, I'm a frontline provider. I need a therapist. And they will find you one anywhere in the country, um, which is really awesome. And they are really great people just trying to help. And they basically are just made up of a network of therapists. And if they don't have someone in your particular region, they put out a call and they find the people. But again, acute injury, if you don't fix it, leads to a chronic problem. You guys know that better than anyone. Um, for the longer term, we need to think about protecting mental health. We also need to think about how this could come back. We could have another wave. I saw the pictures from the Lake of the Ozarks there's no way you guys didn't see those pictures. Um, medical care itself, as we know it, is going to be different. We, you know, I think even if this doesn't come back in waves, like, are people wearing masks? Are we all going to, like, not have patients in the office all the time? It's going to be really different. Um, our patients also are anxious and scared and depressed and scared to come get care. And that's something we're going to be dealing with. And we need to be thinking about how we can design models for mental health that are sustainable. So what else should we be thinking about? I think, you know, a lot of this is coming from what, what do I think <laughs> based on the data. But I think, you know, we should be thinking about screening and outreach to the high-risk groups. So I think even from a department level, like those people who have a history of psychiatric and substance use disorders are going to be at higher risk. Those people who are exposed to COVID-19 patients are exposed to COVID-19 through family and friends or, you know, infect, infected themselves. Um, medical students and trainees are also at higher risk. We need to be thinking about sustainability of programs. So we, we created this whole COVID with, coping with COVID program. Which of these things do we want in the long run? Do we want a hotline all the time? Do we want groups all the time? Or do you guys just want us to have a more robust service in which you can get care all the time with therapists and providers? Um, we also really need to be talking about culture and stigma and vulnerability as a medical system. I think if anything, what a pandemic does is show the faults, but in showing the faults, 
maybe highlight some things we should have changed a long time ago. Um, one of which is, hey, didn't I just show you data that the medical system has had depression and suicide problems with getting care for years and maybe right now we could actually change that. So I think that's something we could focus on. Um, and then I think beyond mental health ways that you could think about improving mental health from a team or leadership perspective outside of the mental health realm would be making sure people have adequate supplies, thinking about workload and breaks and shifts, thinking about things like sick leave, parental leave, childcare, thinking about good and con consistent communication. So that was very evident in things. I mean, I think people can, can tell you that the level of stress from getting 400 emails a day at the beginning of COVID was like very evident and not knowing which email to read and which protocol to follow. And so that's very clear in the data, but it's also very clear in experience. <laughs> um, very important to have supportive leadership and peers. And then this idea of altruism being better than compulsion. So, um, you know, like it's better to like want to work on the COVID unit than to be forced to be put on the COVID unit if you can. So I think, you know, that's not always a choice. New York, they didn't have a choice, but sometimes it is a choice and that's tends to be better for mental health. Something else to be thinking about is how can you use your own voice? Definitely helps. So <laughs> this data, there's a study that basically said most of the people tweeting about COVID and opening up the government and opening up and going back to work and all that stuff were bots. And then there was a new paper that said, you know, or a new article in the Wall Street Journal that said doctors are trying to help make facts go viral. So on the one hand, there's just a lot of bots. And on the other hand, doctors are trying to combat the bots. So we need help. Um, so if you're at all interested in social media, if you're at all interested in writing, if you're at all interested in using your voice for advocacy, like please write me or message me or something thing because it's definitely something I'm passionate about. It's definitely something I want more people in medicine to get involved in because I think it's really important that we use our voice that way and advocacy is definitely something that can help your mental health because doing good is good and is a way to, and altruism is a good defense if anything. I'll leave you with this. So I just think, who? what's the bravest thing you ever said? Ask Piglet. Help said who? So I think, you know, it's really brave to ask for help. It might not feel like it in the moment. We might not be a culture in medicine that is quite there yet where it feels brave, but it's brave to me. And I think hopefully we'll get there um, where it is brave. Um, thank you to everybody who's helped employee support team, the Amplified This people who are all of the people that I basically showed you videos of. <laughs> um, and then everybody gave me data and hopefully I'll answer questions. I know that was a little long, so I'll do my best. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Gold, for coming today. Um, for everyone in attendance, here are the QR codes. And if you have any questions right now, I know someone raised their hand, but if you could just type it in the chat, it's gonna be easier for me to pull it up um, at the podium here. But, I'll start off uh, to say thank you, uh, Dr. Gold, for talking to us about this topic. The question that uh, stemmed from it is, how can we help each other seek the mental health care that we may need if we are afraid of taking the first step for being judged harshly? That's a very good question. I mean, I think one of the most important things with that is to figure out how to create an environment where people at least know that you're a person that they can go to to talk about that. Um, I think it's hard to know how to do that. Sometimes it's being open and vulnerable as a leader yourself um, because then people know that you're at least a leader that they can talk to. It doesn't mean you always have to be vulnerable about mental health. You can actually just be vulnerable about things being hard. Um, people can tell that if you talk about stress or work stress or family stress or anything that's difficult that maybe that means that there's like an opening to talk about stuff um, and that can create a culture where then people feel a little bit better about asking for help. Um, I think it's just like organic good conversation. It's definitely not easy. It's definitely something that's going to take time but I think it's like person to person change. That would be my opinion. 
All right. Another question is, uh, what has been the use of the Zoom calls in call line resources? Like how heavy? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, like at the beginning, not as, not as high as we would have wanted. I think pretty consistent since then. I mean, um, we have attendance to all the Zoom groups. I think like pretty consistent attendance, like, I, I think the numbers are like less than 10, but that's what we would want, like five, in the five to 10 range each time. Um, you know, consistent people, probably a little bit lower than we would want. So we definitely have space. Um, hotline calls, definitely lower than we would have expected. But again, I think hard to tell if that's one advertising to um, lack of us really as big of a surge as maybe we would have expected for better or worse or social distancing, all of these things that could have been good, um, we were very prepared. So I think there are lots of reasons why that could have been not used as much and it still exists and we don't, we don't get calls every day for sure. Right. Next question I have is, how can the university and the hospital help physicians on visas who are experiencing added anxieties about job loss and deportation of family members? That's a big one. Um, I mean, I think probably they need to realize that you're a specific group and have real good conversations with you. So first of all, thanks for bringing that up because I think that that is something that needs to be brought up with leadership and I'm gonna actually take that specific question back to our group and make sure that we bring it up and have that conversation because we brought it up a little bit at the beginning but I'm gonna re-up it um, because I think what really is important is that these kind of things get flagged for us if they get missed because I do think that there are lots of different groups with different experiences because I, we just kind of realized that even like Postdocs, for example, are someone that we were completely uh, unaware were having so much stress and so much different experience with this whole thing. And a lot of them were on visas and a lot of them are international and a lot of them were struggling and were alone because they're like one person in a department. So I think if it, it would be really helpful for things like that, even if you like emailed some of us or you flagged it and we'll do a really, we'll do our best, but alerting us would be one place to start, I think. I'm more than willing, I can pass on that question if you'd like uh, later. But um, in the interest of time, I'm going to have this last question. And it starts off says, Excellent talk. Thank you so much. How can we measure if these interventions are helping? And what time frames should we be using to assess improvement or worsening of well being in our faculty and trainees? Good question. Um, I mean, I think with our interventions, we didn't, I mean, the best that serve, we didn't necessarily do like a baseline and later and, you know, we didn't necessarily go at it as like a research model, which for better or worse was just sort of like, a, we're just trying to help and get everybody together and do the best we can. Um, I think we can look at sort of use um, sort of awareness of it through Dr. Evanoff's survey, because he did put, like, do you know that these exist? Um, and I think that is something we could look at. I think we could look at if anything changes in Dr. Evanoff's and um, Dr. Duncan's surveys for the trainees, if anything goes down. I mean, I think timing-wise, you know, it's real hard, because I think it's going to really depend on what changes. So are we going to get a second wave? Are you know, uh, if, if everything is just the same and this is just the way that it is, I think you could say a year or three years would be, you know, <laughs> the way that people would do these studies, six months, one year, three years. But I think if things are, are changing again and like the fall is different and we have another wave, we're going to have to reevaluate what it looks to reevaluate this stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, we didn't necessarily study this, which you know, for our fault or not, was more of an altruism thing. Um, but, but maybe we can look at retroactively thinking about a way to look at this, for sure. OK, 
Okay. Thank you again, Dr. Gold, for taking the time today and, and for answering questions here. Um, that'll be all we have for this morning, but uh, join us next week as we continue our lecture series. Uh, same time, same place on Thursday. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Gold, and thank you for all those in attendance today.